Good evening. Welcome to Lutheran Church of the Savior for our midweek Lenten service. Uh, this is week number four, and like the springtime weather outside, it's a great reminder that spring is coming, new life returns, and uh, the resurrection is around the corner. Um, I'd like to remind everybody just real quickly that we have a voters meeting on Sunday uh, after the late service, and it's going to be an important one, so make sure that uh, you're, you attend if you're able. And... Uh, I think with that, we're ready to start. So uh, if you'd like to stand and join in the opening versicles. <clears throat> o Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, King who comes to save us. We join together in Psalm 19, read responsively. The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. The just decrees of the Lord are true. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We join together in our opening hymn. may be seated. A reading from Exodus, the 16th chapter. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. 
On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it each one of you as much as he can eat. You shall take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more and some less. But when they measured with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Be to God. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Be to God. I ask you to please rise for the reading of the gospel. A reading from St. John, the sixth chapter. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord, my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. We join together to sing.
seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. Friends, I have been training my entire life for this sermon. It is all about bread, which is one of my favorite things in the entire world. Uh, it should be clear from my <laughs> demeanor here. Um, is there anything, though, that's more common in our world or in our imagination than bread? For most of human history, the vast majority of Western people's caloric intake came from bread, as high as 80% of people's calories in the, middle, in the Middle Ages. Bread is fundamental to nearly every culture, and it's still a critical part of most people's diets. The incredible variety of bread products on the market makes this clear. I was actually looking out there. I counted six different kinds of breads uh, just for soup supper tonight. And I can't imagine walking down the bread aisle at Market Basket with my great-grandparents, <laughs> let alone a denizen of first century Palestine. It would blow their minds. Bread has been a means of control. It's been the source of riots. It's been a marker of social class. It's been a symbol of the government's largesse. You think of bread and circuses. As Roman Mars and Sam Greenspan note in a 99% Invisible podcast episode, Bread is even baked into our language and into our social structures. The word companion is from the Latin word cum, meaning with, and pan, panis, meaning bread. Literally, a companion is somebody we break bread with. And the word lord comes from the Old English hlaford, something like that, hlaford, which means bread keeper. Someone who can provide bread for his people is quite literally in English, lord. Bread is also all over the Bible, and we still use it today in our worship services and Holy Communion. It's one of the most enduring images God uses for his provision for his people, both physically and metaphorically. It's also part of the worship that God commands in Leviticus as part of the peace offering, part of Aaron's ordination, and in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's into this rich backdrop of societal expectation, religious significance, and daily need that Jesus drops a thermonuclear bomb in John 6. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is really disturbing to the religious leaders of his day, as he is claiming straight out that he is God's provision for Israel, the food they need to be sustained through every day of their lives. He is the promised treasure of bread for hungry people. We're getting ahead of ourselves here. Let's look at the scripture and get some context to understand better what Jesus is saying about himself. The first place I found bread in the Bible is actually in Genesis 3. And interestingly, it shows up in God's curse on a rebellious Adam and Eve. He says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Those are the words we use in Ash Wednesday at the beginning of this Lenten season. But from the very beginning, bread is part of God's provision for his people, even if it must come through that toil and hardship. It shows up a whole bunch of other times in Genesis. You can think of Abraham when he feeds the, uh, the visitors, the three visitors, right? That um, theogony there, and theogony, that's not the right word, sorry. When he feeds the visitors, um, you think of uh, Esau and Jacob, you think of uh, Isaac and Esau, uh, all these different uh, examples, right? The next place that bread becomes critical uh, is in Exodus 16, which is our Old Testament lesson for this evening. We read about the Israelites' early days in the desert. Now, the events of Exodus to this point are miracle after miracle. You're familiar with the story. After many plagues, the Egyptians release the Israelites, but then change their mind and give chase. God sends a pillar of fire and smoke to block the pursuit and then parts the Red Sea to let the Israelites escape and then brings it back down to destroy Pharaoh's army. The Israelites head into the desert and God provides water for them. Uh, he gives them an oasis to stay at. But now it's the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from Egypt and now the Israelites are hungry and they're complaining. For you mathematicians out there, that's like 45 days after God literally parted the sea so the Israelites could walk through on dry land. I've put off lawn work for longer than the Israelites uh, managed to not complain to God. 
Anyway, they're on their third strike. When the Egyptians are chasing them, they've asked Moses if maybe there weren't enough graves in Egypt, and that's why he brought them into the desert to die. When they get to Marah, where there was bitter water, they complain about not having anything to drink, and now they're bellyaching about food. Does God smite them like they probably deserve? Does he turn a blind eye to them and make them figure it out for themselves? No, he provides for them. God promises them bread and quail if they'll trust him for their daily provision. And you know what? He provides. God gives each family exactly what it needs, no more and no less. The Israelites were so impressed with this that they put some of the manna in the Ark of the Covenant as a reminder of God's provision for them day after day. There's a whole sermon in there about daily provision, your daily bread, how that relates to the Lord's prayer, how we trust in God, but we'll, we'll save that one for later. It's not too long after this now that God gives his people the Mosaic Covenant. In this law, God provides a series of sacrifices that his people are commanded to perform. One of these is the sacrifice of peace offerings, and this is in Leviticus chapter 7. And in this case, the one making the offering is to bring unleavened loaves mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil, as well as, as loaves of, unleavened, of leavened bread. The sacrifice here is a breaking of bread. It's a sharing of something precious in the form of their daily sustenance, slathered with the rare gift of oil to restore relationship. In this case, the relationship between God and his people that has been broken by sin. Sorry. In addition, the tabernacle even has a special bread bar. It's right up at the front of the tabernacle, opposite the menorah and the altar of incense. Uh, and there's a special table called the shulchan, where the bre presence bread sat. There's 12 loaves of bread continually in the presence of God. Leviticus 24.8 says these loaves are from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. These are the loaves that David is going to eat when he's on the run, and the loaves that would have been present in the temple in Jerusalem. Every week for like 1,400 years, someone from the Kehathite division of the Levites baked 12 loaves of bread, stacked them in two stacks of six loaves each, they're each about five pounds of flour in each of them. They're big, big loaves. And they place them before God as a reminder of his presence and provision in the life of his people in Israel. Every week, that bread was given as a reminder of the covenant and God's provision. Between this bread of the presence and the peace offering bread that was offered uh, regularly, God's people were primed to read bread in a spiritually complex, richly nuanced, and well-buttered way. Now, in today's third reading, Jesus has a huge crowd following him that's hungry and needs food. Jesus takes five loaves of barley, he gives thanks to his father, he breaks the bread, and he, he feeds 5,000 people. Jesus and his disciples sneak away across the Sea of Galilee, but the crowds catch up and they try to understand what has happened. Jesus tells them, don't work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give them. They're confused, I think, here, and they ask him for a sign that they might see and believe. They use the example of Moses. Well, Moses gave them bread. Could Jesus do something like that, maybe? As if miraculously feeding them less than 24 hours ago didn't count. <laughs> Let's reread the passage. Uh, this is uh, John 6, verse 32. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I think it's hard to underestimate or overestimate how earth-shaking this is. Moses gave them bread that literally rotted to maggots overnight. And here Jesus is promising eternal bread, the bread of the presence that was reserved for the priests, but now is given to feed and preserve his people. Jesus isn't making a clever analogy here about how important he is. He's not making some extended metaphor or a discourse. He is literally the provision for our sin. He's the sacrifice of peace with God and the image of the presence of God among us. He makes this really clear a few verses after our assigned reading ends. This is in verse 48. Jesus again says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. 
So this is why in our first Corinthians passage, St. Paul says that Israel was led by Christ in the Old Testament. Our fathers all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus is the true source of the manna that they ate and the water that they drank. Right about now, you might be thinking, when is he going to talk about communion? It's the most obvious place where bread shows up in our church today. Well, that and here at Soup Supper. The Holy Sacrament is a place where Jesus shows up in physical form right here. He shows up in, with, and under those weird little wafers of bread. St. Paul talks about this just a few verses after his discussion of manna. He says, the cup of a blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Again, that's in 1 Corinthians 10. So the bread that you eat here at the communion rail each week is not ordinary bread. Well, it is ordinary bread, but it's not just ordinary bread. No, when we join together in Holy Communion, Jesus promises to place his very body into ours. To break this bread and to eat it is to become part of Jesus, the same way that the bread becomes a part of our body. This is a miracle, and we get to experience it every week. Now, what does this mean for our daily lives? I think there's two things to consider here. First, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of hungry people. Sure, they have plenty to eat. They've got nice cars, sense of clothes, latest gadgets and gizmos. But if you scratch the surface, my friends are hungry. Modern life is full of empty calories, things that sate your appetite for a while, but leave you just as hungry a few minutes later, if not more. People today are just as hungry for the bread of life as they were when they stalked Jesus at the Sea of Galilee. Just look at some of the top-selling titles in Amazon's self-help section. I looked at these last night. The creative act, a way of being. Eight rules of love, how to find it, keep it, and let it go. The mountain is you, transforming self-sabotage into self-mastery. I kind of want to read that one. Good inside, a guide to becoming the parent you want to be. The light we carry, overcoming in uncertain times. People are looking for meaning and purpose wherever they think it might be found. In what we make with our hands, in the relationships we have, in our family lives, in our personal freedom and autonomy, in celebrity. They're looking everywhere, it seems, but the one place that they could really find it. The second thing I think we ought to consider is that we are not here by accident. If Jesus wanted to, he'd certainly be able to grab us all, take us up to heaven, and shut down the whole show here on earth. However, he doesn't, or he hasn't at least yet. That must mean there's still something that we need to be doing here. Now, stick with me here for a minute. This is going to get a little weird. But consider the last time you walked past a Subway restaurant. Can you imagine it? That big green and yellow sign. You know, it's the sandwich place for people who don't have New England sub shops. If you remember something about those sad excuses for sandwiches, you probably remember the smell of baking bread. There's actually a whole conspiracy theory online that uh, Subway vents their ovens into their lobbies, into the sidewalks outside, so that you smell the bread and get enticed. Uh, it turns out that's not true. It just, baking bread smells really good and people like it. Uh, and you actually remember smells really well. This is something I don't know if you, if you know, but smell is a, is a key marker for memories. You can imagine the smell of baking cookies takes you right back to mom's table, right? It takes you to the kitchen where grandma was mixing up a batch of brownies or something. Um, but as you walked by that subway, it enticed you, it made your mouth water, and it got you thinking, huh, maybe I do need a footlong sandwich. But you know what? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2 that we are the aroma of Christ unto God for those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. As we break bread together as a community, both in Holy Communion and in fellowship, we are the aroma of Christ to a world that is desperately seeking sustenance. We get to be that sweet smell of break, baking bread and breaking bread, and that bread is the bread of life. Jesus is still here. In his word, in his sacrament, Christ provides what our hungry world is looking for, bread that sustains, fulfills, and sates, gives us what we are so desperately seeking. I pray that as you go from this place, you do so remembering that God has provided everything we need through his son, Jesus Christ, both our daily bread and our bread of life that lasts forever. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Please stand as we join together in, in prayer. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. And My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For behold, from this day all generations will call me blessed. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted the lowly. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy. mercy. Lord, have mercy. We join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you reveal yourself as the bread of life who satisfies all the hungry souls that return to you in repentance and faith. Renew our hearts and minds during this Lenten season as we receive the promised treasures of your word. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Gracious God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to meditate again on the cross of Christ and receive your promised treasures. Lead us to see that our sins caused Jesus great agony in the garden, that our sins nailed him to the cross of Calvary. Lord Jesus, grant that especially during this sacred season, the treasured story of your wondrous love for us would draw us closer to you. Holy Spirit, lift up troubled souls everywhere. Grant wholeness to those hurting in heart, body, and mind. Work your healing power in the lives of those in need and in the lives of all we name before you in our hearts. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all.